Let's turn to God's word this morning, Psalm number 11, and we'll conclude our study in this psalm this morning. Psalm number 11, and let us hear the word of God. In the Lord put I my trust, I say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain. For lo, the wicked bend their bow, they make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in the heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked, and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and an horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. Amen. Let's pray and seek the face of the Lord. Gracious and eternal Heavenly Father, we bow humbly and reverently again in thy presence this morning. We thank thee, O Lord, for what has already taken place in this service. We pray, Lord, that each meeting that's been announced even for this week, Lord, will be blessed by the presence of God. Pray, Lord, that you'll anoint each one who will speak at these meetings. We pray that ever, every endeavor of the gospel will be profitable for the kingdom of Christ. We pray, Lord, especially for this service this morning. We pray for this message from God's precious word. We thank thee for a living word. We thank thee for a book that is able to change lives, that is able to bring men to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank thee, Lord, that this book has been used in many of our lives in this gathering. We thank you, Lord, it's a precious book this morning because in the covers of this book we have found the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, we found salvation, we found pardon and peace with God. And we thank thee, Lord, for God's people. We find instruction in how to live in godliness. And Lord, we pray that this morning thou will encourage God's people. We acknowledge we live in a difficult world. We live in a very evil world. We live in a world where Satan still is running about. And we pray, Lord, that thou will give us the grace this morning to look away from everything that would discourage us and to look to Christ. We pray, O Lord, that we'll get our eyes fixed firmly upon our Savior, the one who is the victorious risen King. And we pray, Lord, this morning thou will encourage us to walk on with thee. We thank thee, Lord, for the day and hour you saved us. We thank thee, Lord, for the zeal that we knew at that time. We pray, Lord, thou wilt restore that. We pray, Lord, thou wilt revive each of us again. We pray, O Lord, thou wilt just give us that fire again within our soul. And we pray, Lord, even this morning, ere we would leave this gathering, that God's people will be stirred in the things of God again, resolved to go through with God. Pray for those who are cold at heart, O Lord. Touch them, we pray, this morning. Bring them back. Pray for those who are not saved. O Lord, that this morning they will see the seriousness of their condition. Pray, Lord, this morning, even through the word of God, that, Lord, thou wilt speak to them. They will not hear the voice of a man, but, O Lord, they will hear the voice of God. I pray, O Lord, you'll put your finger upon the soul. I pray, Lord, conviction will be upon the heart. And I pray, O Lord, salvation will be brought to trembling souls today in God's house. We do pray, Lord, for those who have sat for many years. They know the gospel, and yet... As we were learning this morning in Bible class, knowledge is not what the Lord requires, but, O Lord, it's action. We pray that they will put faith to their knowledge, and, Lord, that they will put their lives upon the finished work of God. We pray, O Lord, that thou wilt bless us, help us to rightly divide the word of truth. We acknowledge our great need when we come to do something like this, that it's not of the wisdom of man, but it's the power of God. And we pray, Lord, that thou wilt empty me of self and sin and fill me with thy Holy Spirit, that I might have the power to rightly divide the word of truth, to deliver the word of God to the glory of thy name, that men, women, boys and girls may profit from the word of God this morning. This is our desire, that we would see Jesus. And therefore, Lord, close us in with thyself. Give help to preach and to hear. And above all, Lord, soften our hearts, that we might yield to the will of God. For we ask it in our Savior's precious and worthy name. Amen. There's been great encouragement for the children of God as we have read this psalm over the past three times. The realities of the tax of the enemy have been highlighted, and we found that they have desired to shoot the upright in heart. One of their main strategies has been identified to seek to destroy the foundations of our faith. But praise the Lord, the method of standing against the enemy and the path of victory has also been presented, and that ought to bring us glory. You know, in God's word, the problems are not just highlighted, but also the cures and the remedies to those problems. You see, a man isn't just told that he is a sinner, but he is told of the cure that has been provided for sinners. 
A lukewarm Christian has his apathy highlighted, but the Lord also highlights how that apathy can be turned into zeal again. Child of God is made aware that they're in a battle. But that's not where the teaching ends. Thank God they're also taught there's power in the Lord Jesus Christ to stand against the enemy and to be victorious in our walk with the Lord. You know, there is power in the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ said, All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore. We don't need to go any further in that verse than to think of those first three words. Go ye therefore. And because of the power and the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can go forward. We ought to be going forward as a people of God, as a church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go ye therefore. Why? Because I've got the power. If we ever try and depend upon our own power for victory in our personal life or corporately as a church, then we will feel miserably. But we can go forward with all boldness and holy victory in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. His work and his power alone. In verse number four and five, the power of the Lord is highlighted, but it's interesting to note that the Lord is dealing with the peoples of the earth. And you know, the Lord does deal with the peoples of the earth. There are many people and they think, well, the Lord has nothing to do with me. I'm not interested in religion. I'm an atheist. I don't believe in the gospel. The Lord has nothing to do with me. Will you come to God's word and you will find that God has something to do with every single person that lives upon the face of this earth. He deals with the people whom he has made. And you'll find that the word of God tells us in verse number four, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven and his eyes behold. His eyelids try the children of men. Now that word try means to investigate, to search, and to prove. So this morning in this gathering, already, before we go any further, the Lord has investigated your heart, he has searched your heart, and he has proved your heart to show who you are, what you are, and what you really stand for. Notice his position. The Lord is in his holy temple. Well, that speaks of his holiness. This is a pure and just searching Notice that the Lord's throne is in heaven. This speaks of his sovereignty, of his exaltation. He sees all before him. He knows all and that is before him. There is nothing hid from the Lord. In fact, Proverbs 15 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. The Lord knows all men and women, all boys and girls. He knows the heart of each person in this meeting today. He knows your condition this morning. You know, the Lord knows if you have a broken heart this morning. And perhaps there are those in this gathering and their hearts are heavy because of events, because of circumstances, because of loss. The Lord knows the brokenness of your heart this morning. The Lord knows the fears of your heart this morning. And perhaps there are those in this meeting and you have real, genuine fears. The Lord knows them. The Lord knows those who are sitting in God's house and have come with a heart prepared, longing for his voice and his direction. The Lord knows those who have a humble heart that just simply seek to be a part of the work of God and part of the blessing. The Lord knows those who have a rejoicing heart this morning. And thank God we can rejoice in the presence of the Lord. But you know, the Lord also sees those who have a hypocritical heart. Those who say one thing but think another. Those who profess one thing with their life but live another. The Lord sees a cold heart this morning. And maybe you've been even in a prayer meeting this morning. And yet your heart's still cold. See, man looks in outward appearance, but the Lord looks in the heart. And can I also say the Lord sees a sinful heart this morning. The Lord sees you and he knows you all together. He knows your spiritual state. He knows your human emotions that dwell within the heart. And that's a wonderful thing because God sees all individually. God sees all thoroughly, and God sees all spiritually. Now, this action of the Lord's looking and the Lord's trying of the heart, whenever the Lord tries something, it always results in judgment and actions. What do I mean by that? Well, in Matthew chapter 9, when the Lord looked across Jerusalem, he saw with his spiritual sight and wisdom he saw that the people were wandering about a sheep without a shepherd. So as he looked upon them, he saw their condition. He tried them, he proved, and that was the result. The result was that he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. But that resulted in action. The Lord just didn't see that, but the Lord acted upon what he saw. What did he do? He called men to pray, and then he equipped men to go. 
And whenever the Lord sees something, it always results in a judgment and an action. What are the actions and judgments that result in the Lord's investigation of our heart this morning? Well, for those who are marked by the blood, for those who are saved by the grace of God, that token of their salvation, the blood mark upon them through repentance of sin and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. When the Lord looks upon your heart this morning, he declares you to be righteous. Thank God this morning for the security uh, and the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. For those who are saved this morning, washed in the blood, the Lord declares you to be righteous upon the standing of the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ. But for those whom he finds in their sin, for those of you who are unsaved this morning, there is condemnation upon your head. This is a present reality. It's not that you will be condemned, but God's word says in John three eighteen, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. That condemnation is the outpouring of the wrath of God upon the soul of the sinner. And in reality, you are but a heartbeat away from that. You are but a breath away from that. And the Bible says that the Lord hates those who are wicked and those who love violence. Look what it says there in verse 5. The Lord trieth the righteous. But thank God when he sees them, he's delighted with them. Because the merit he sees in their life is the merit of Christ. Therefore, they're accepted and the beloved. But it says there in verse number five, the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Now, specifically, the violence being referred to is those who are persecuting the psalmist, those who are standing with the arrows ready to fling them into the heart of the psalmist, Satan and his demons, and those men and women who do this work of Satan Those are people whom God hates. Now, many people might sit back at that and say, are you sure? Can you honestly say that God hates someone? But God's word has revealed to us that while God loves righteousness, well, then it's only natural that he hates sin. And those who are partakers of sin, and those who love sin, and those who indulge in sin... What's interesting is that the Lord declares to us that while he hates the righteous, their actions will be stopped. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Their actions will be brought to an end. How will they be brought to an end? They'll be brought to an end by their standing before the judgment seat of the Lord. You see, the wicked has his day for a moment. Those who persecute the people of God have their day for a moment. The devil has his day, but it's for a moment. All will stand before God. All will bow before God. All will be judged before God. And what I'm saying here is this morning is this. That for the saint, when the Lord looks upon you and tries you, that's a blessing because he sees your needs. But for the sinner, it's a terror. For the sinner, it's a terror because he sees you all together. And even whenever the Lord sees things in the life of his children that are unholy as Christians, he deals with us as children under the covenant of grace, in mercy, and in love, drawing us back into fellowship with him. You see, he highlights our sin as believers, but he also highlights his willingness to cleanse us from that sin and to restore fellowship and our walk with God. You know, God hates sin, whether it be in the life of the saved or the unsaved. God hates sin. God is against sin by his nature. He cannot tolerate sin. God's word does teach us That we have a God who hates certain things. And I want you to turn with me to Proverbs chapter 6 because these are highlighted in the word. Proverbs chapter 6 says these, sorry, chapter 6 verse 16. Proverbs 6 verse 16. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Now let's just stop for a few moments and look at these, because we have to bear in mind that these are things which the Lord has set himself against. Now these are marks of the ungodly. And child of God, as we go through them this morning, let us try our hearts. 
Because we're not above and beyond falling into things that are contrary to the will of God. What's the first thing that's mentioned here that brings dishonor to the name of the Lord that the Lord hates? It is a proud look. That is those who set themselves up above others with a haughty spirit and filled with pride. Pride is mentioned many times in the scripture. We can say it was pride in the heart of Adam and Eve that caused them to fall into sin. Philippians 2 verse 2 tells us that we are to fulfill the joy, that we are to be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. And it's so easy, even as Christians, by the natural human instinct that we have to set ourselves above others, to think ourselves better than others, to look down upon others. But the Bible tells us that we are to be of one accord. We are to be of one mind. We're all on the one level, sinners saved by grace. And it is wrong for any child of God to exalt themselves above another. A proud look. A lying tongue. This is a mark again of the ungodly. A lying tongue. That is to say falsehoods, to say things that aren't true. And that includes when someone is relating something that has happened, they're giving an account of something that has happened, whenever they exaggerate to the degree that it's untrue. That is a lying tongue. And as human beings, again, we're prone to exaggeration for many different reasons. And somebody continually tells you things that are partially true and partially made up, then it gets gets to the stage of no faith in that person. That is not the type of person that the Lord desires his children to be. He desires them to be people of truth, to be people of a faithful testimony that will tell the truth. This is not the mark of the children of God. He also says there, hands that shed innocent blood. That word shed means to be poured out, to be spilled forth from one who was not guilty of a crime. You know, there are many martyrs who have died for the faith. And the Lord is against those that have brought their execution. But you know, there are many who, although they're alive today, their reputation has been destroyed by those who have told lies and falsehoods. And again, the Lord hates this. Fourthly, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. And that means literally wearying oneself with wickedness and evil and injustice. Being so taken up in sin that it wearies you. Takes your energies, takes your money, it takes your mind. The heart that plots and plans sinful activities. Now God hates this. This is a mark of the ungodly. But God hates it in the life of his children. We are to be careful that our minds are brought under control. You know, we can start thinking about something good and then in a few seconds we're away at something evil. In a place we shouldn't be, saying things we shouldn't have said, doing things we shouldn't be doing. Or we haven't done them physically, but we've done them in the heart and the mind. And yet what's in the heart and in the mind does come out in the life. While we work to keep our bodies under discipline, we ought to work to keep our minds and our hearts under discipline. Whenever we feel ourselves drifting towards sinful thoughts and thinking... We must immediately call on the Lord to help us and to fill our minds with Christ. Then it says there, that feet that run to mischief. That's running to badness or evil. In other words, people who delight in sin. They can't get enough of it. When they hear of sinful activities, they're on their way. They leave everything and they run to see what they can engage in. A false witness that speaketh lies. A witness is one who gives a testimony or an account. And whether it be for yourself or for another We are not to tell lies in the accounts that we've been asked for. And sadly today, throughout this land, it's continually, it just seems to be that lie after lie is told just when people feel like it. And you know, you can fool people today and you can cover the truth for a little while. But God brings everything into judgment. Every secret thing into judgment. And finally, he that soweth discord among the brethren... In other words, those who cause strife and contention that would cause people to have an argument among the people of God. Now, making an effort to separate God's people rather than to unite God's people. And I'm going to ask this morning, to my own heart and to your own heart, I wonder if the activities we engaged in this week promoted unity among the people of God or promoted discord. I wonder with what you do with your weeknights, will that promote unity and encouragement and growth among the people of God and the church that he has called you to? Or is what you're doing going to cause discord and division? 
Now, what's the opposite of discord? The opposite of discord is harmony. Harmony. Working together with a single purpose. The aim, whenever you sing in a choir, is that you have different people singing different notes, but they sing together. And the goal is that we have a chord that sounds very musical and pleasing to the ear. That's harmony. If someone's out of tune or in the wrong place or in the wrong note, you'll hear it. And that is the picture here. When someone is out of line with God's teaching, when someone is out of line spiritually, then there is disharmony and there is disunity. And it's imperative, child of God, that you and I ask that the Lord would deal with our hearts to make us those who promote unity and love within the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the purpose of the church. Well, yes, we're to fight against Satan, we're to fight against sin, but we're to do it together in love for the glory of God. This is to be the mark of the church that the Lord Jesus Christ has purchased with his own blood. And it is no surprise that the frown of God is upon those who bring disunity and division to a church. And we need to be very careful that what we do brings unity. Now, we don't overlook sin because that's unbiblical. But we promote unity. How sad whenever someone will make it their effort and take their energies with the body that the Lord has saved as well as their soul to cause the unity among the people of God. You know, we will answer for our words. We'll answer for actions. We'll answer for attitudes. What a solemn thing to have the cause of disunity brought before your account. Perhaps this morning it would do as well as God's people to remind us of the things that God hates. And seek by his help to have no part in such things. We are saved in Christ to love, the lo- to love the brethren in Christ and to love the lost for Christ. There are no exceptions to the rule. The Bible tells us that those whom the Lord hates, those who are unsaved, those who will continue in their sin, those who will not repent of their sin, those who will not heed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that their end will be an end of terror. The Bible tells us that in verse number six, upon the wicked, those who die in the wickedness of their sin and go into eternity, he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. Now that word snares, it means metal sheets or nets. That will prevent or snare a person from escaping. Friend, that's hell. That's hell. There is no escape from hell. You're there for all eternity. The fire and brimstone, the literal translation there is sulfur. That which causes great anguish to the body. That which causes great pain to the body. But that's not actually what the worst part of hell is. Because it talks there about an horrible tempest. And the picture here is that God will breathe or blow upon the wicked in anger. Another way of putting this is to say that the wrath of God will be poured upon the unrighteous. Upon the sinner. Yes, it's one thing to be trapped in an awful place. It's one thing for the body to be in pain and anguish. But God will breathe upon the soul. The anguish of a soul in hell. And that thought of a horrible tempest also has the thought of famine. And there's a great famine in hell because there will be an eternal lack of an opportunity to be saved. There'll be an eternal lack of gospel invitation. There'll be an eternal lack of forgetting the past. You'll remember it all. There'll be eternal lack of getting away from the past of your sin before God. The Bible tells us what the Lord Jesus Christ said about hell, weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth. The soul and the spirit will be destroyed, and yet without end in hell. There'll be fiery furnaces, there'll be outer darkness, there's unquenchable fires, there's endless torments. And John Calvin, as he read over those descriptions, said, By such expressions, the Holy Spirit certainly intended to confound all our senses with dread. And I've heard of men saying, well, I don't want to scare people into salvation. 
But the Lord makes it very clear that there is a fearful thing ahead of the ungodly. And I would rather this morning you trembled in time than perished in eternity. I would rather this morning you know as you leave the house of God that you're going headlong to hell. A heartbeat separating you and God's wrath. Rather to run out with some fuzzy feeling in your heart and be able to curse the preacher for his unfaithfulness. Hell is a place where God's full wrath and fury is poured out eternally on sinners. And Christ knew what he spoke of because on the cross of Calvary it was poured out in him as our substitute. He bore what we deserved. The just for the unjust that he might bring us to God. Or thank God there is deliverance from hell this morning. There is pardon from sin. There is assurance of salvation. And it's found in Christ and Christ alone. Turn ye. Oh, turn ye, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Why will ye die, man and woman, boy and girl in Muckerfeld? Why will ye die this morning? Why will you go to hell? There's a Savior who's willing and ready to save. And I want you to notice what the description of this eternal destiny is in verse number six. This shall be the portion of their cup. This shall be the portion of their cup. Now, the portion of someone's cup, it means their lot in life. What their life is filled with and what their end will be filled with. They will receive in the body and soul these things because of their rebellion and sin in their lives. But I thank God this morning that for the godly and for those who are saved by the grace of God, we can say, the Lord is the portion of my cup. That's a biblical thing. That is a scriptural thing. Psalm 16, 5. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of mine cup. Thou maintainest my lot. Psalm 23. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Now what is your cup filled with today? It's either filled with sin and the wrath of God or it's filled with the blessing and the joy of Christ. What is your life today? What does it consist of? I want you to consider just a few things about the cup. As mentioned in scripture, for it's very important that believers understand that the Lord is not only their salvation, but the Lord is their satisfaction. There are many believers today, yes, they're saved, but they're looking for satisfaction elsewhere. Psalm 16, 5, the Lord is a portion of mine inheritance and my cup. The Lord is a portion of my inheritance. Now, there is a thought that takes us to Joshua, chapter 3 and verse 33. And if you turn with me just one minute, I want to show you that even with that language, the minds of the children of Israel, as they would have heard that word read in the synagogue, would have been taken back to the book of Joshua. Because in Joshua chapter 3, or 13, the inheritance was given out in the land. And as all the different tribes stood up and got their inheritance, we come down to verse number 33. And we come to the tribe of Levi. And the tribe of Levi were the priests. They were responsible for the worship of the nation. Joshua 13, verse 33, and it says there, But unto the tribe of Levi, Moses gave not any inheritance. The Lord God of Israel was their inheritance. And I want you to notice that the Levites were a chosen people, just like you and me who are saved were chosen. They were engaged in the worship of God. We ought to be engaged in the worship of God. They were engaged in the proclamation of the gospel. And that was their role as priests in the land. And we're all priests unto God if we're saved. By the grace of God, we are chosen. We're to engage in worship. We're to engage in the proclamation of the gospel. But notice, they were not given an earthly inheritance. That which thrilled them, that which was their portion, was not of this earth. Now, can I just say, earthly possessions are not wrong or bad in themselves because to the other tribes, that's exactly what the Lord gave. And to many in this congregation, the Lord has blessed. Earthly possessions are necessary. But you know, earthly possessions have limitations. There's a limitation of time. And there's also temptation that comes with them. And earthly possessions are problems because the world today is seeking the things of the earth rather than the things of God. And perhaps you, as God's child this morning in this meeting, you're a bit like the Levites there. 
And you have to say that your earthly possessions are few or nil, partially nil. Maybe your health isn't what you planned it to be this morning. Maybe your relationships aren't what you planned them to be. Maybe your job isn't what you dreamed of. Maybe your current condition isn't what you hoped for in life. And you have to say that, humanly speaking, physically speaking, your earthly possessions are few. You haven't much that this world has to offer. Well, I want to encourage you this morning, because if you look on at the rest of verse 33, it says, "Um, Unto the tribe of Levi, Moses gave not any inheritance, but the Lord God of Israel was their inheritance. And I think sometimes God's people have forgotten past that. And they've forgotten that, that we have the Lord as our inheritance. We have his possessions, his blessings. We have his power, his resources. We have his promises, his presence. They had a task, you know. They had a task to stand and to minister. God has given us the task to do. And as a people of God, we fulfill the task that God has given us to do, to intercede, to worship, and to witness. As the people of God, you will find that God will withhold no good thing because we're walking uprightly. Not only that, but God provided for their needs. We haven't time to turn to it, but Numbers 35, verse 2, there were 48 cities specifically provided for the Levites. Why? Because their time was to be given to the worship of God, to the worship of the people, and they were to spend time in the sanctuary, in the tabernacle, later on in the temple, and then they were to go and live among the people. They weren't always in the tabernacle. They weren't always in the temple. They spent a period of time there, and then they spent a period of time living in these cities, living among the land. The Lord had these cities spread out throughout the land of Israel, so they weren't all living together in a cluster, in a holy huddle, as it were, but they were living throughout the land. And God has placed us in different places, and different communities. We're not living in a commune. We are living in different places that God has placed us to be a light and to be a blessing. And someone once said that in the sanctuary, the Levites brought men to God in prayer. But in the cities, they brought God to men by their holy living. And that ought to be true of us. When we're in the house of God, we ought to be bringing men to God through prayer. But in our homes, in our communities, our workplaces, we ought to be bringing God to men in our lives and our witness and in our testimony. I want you to notice also, they didn't deserve this blessing. And if you go back, and we haven't time to look in Genesis, but you read about the life of Levi as the brother of Joseph. He was a murderer. He was a murderer. He didn't deserve any blessings of God. In fact, he had the curse of Jacob, his father, upon him when Jacob died. And our past is the same because we are sinful. We have the curse upon us, the fall. But thank God, the blessings came to this people through faith. Because whenever they came down, or Moses and Aaron came down the mountain, and they saw the golden calf raised up, the anger of the Lord was upon them, the anger of Moses was upon them. But Moses stood up and Moses asked a question. And Moses said in Exodus 32 and verse number 26, these words, he said, he stood in the gate of the camp and he said, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come on to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together onto him. How did those people, the Levites, receive the blessing of God? Because he stepped out in faith at the command of God, on the promises of God. They were on the Lord's side. They were depending on the Lord. And you see, all blessings from God come through faith in God. And God has a blessing for all those who are his. He says, the Lord is a portion of my inheritance and of my cup. And he maintains my lot. In other words, my standing is maintained. My source of blessing, Christ, is maintained. My provision is maintained. And then it tells us in Psalm 23, Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. I wonder, do you notice what it says before my cup runneth over? Thou anointest my head with oil. What's that speaking about? That's the Holy Ghost. That's a symbol of the Holy Ghost. And when you're saved and you're walking with the Lord and the Holy Spirit bears witness within your heart, then your cup runs over. Why are so many Christians empty and dry today? Because they're not walking in the Spirit. Because they're not honoring the Lord. Because they're not being obedient to the word of God. Friend, if you're obedient to God's word, the devil himself can't hold back the blessing of God. Thank the Lord God knows what we need and he knows when we need it. And we can truly say this morning, if we're walking with the Lord, that my cup overfloweth. In other words, God gives me more than I deserve. He gives me more than I need. And there's also the thought of the overflowing cup, that the blessings that come upon me will bless those around me also. 
And if you're a Christian walking in the Holy Ghost, and you're walking in the Spirit of God, and you're walking honorably before the Lord, you will be blessed, and you'll be a blessing to other people. People will delight to spend time in your presence, to talk to you. It will not be a wearisome thing. They'll not be discouraged. They'll not regret that they, that they rang you to speak to you. But rather, you will be a source of blessing. Do you know, even in this land today, we can look back in the past and see how God has blessed the land, even the unsaved, through the blessings that he's put upon the church of Jesus Christ. And that ought to be true in your life and in my life. We're not all living together, but we're living out there in the world. But we are to be overflowing the blessing of God that others will benefit. The Lord, the righteous Lord, verse 7, loveth righteousness. What is it that ought to be the great motivation to spur the child of God to holy living? A life of discipleship, a life of discipline, even in the midst of difficult days, even when it's under attack. What is it? What is it that ought to spur us on to righteousness? It says, that's what the Lord loveth. And what the Lord loveth, I ought to love. And what the Lord hateth, I ought to hate. And what the Lord does, I ought to do, to the degree and the power that he gives me the ability to do it. In conclusion this morning, what do we do in persecution when we feel the enemy attack? What do we do? Whenever we know the enemy's there, when he's against us, when he's against our heart, we look to the Lord. We pray to the Lord. What can the righteous do? The righteous can pray. What can the righteous do? The righteous can follow. What can the righteous do? The righteous can live a life of blessing. We can go God's way. And we know that whenever we follow him, he leadeth me in paths of righteousness. And then we rest in this wonderful truth. Verse 7, his countenance doth behold the upright. In other words, he knows. I think some of the most beautiful words in Scripture are this. Your heavenly Father knoweth you have need of these things. He knows. And as I said, by God's looking and by God's knowing, that's not where it ends. But God acts upon that knowledge. And God supplies the need. If you need this morning, is there something in your heart that needs to be met, well, thank God your heavenly Father knoweth you have need of these things, and he is ready and willing and able to provide what you need if you will but humble yourself and come before him. A few weeks ago, we sang a hymn, and there were beautiful words, and I quote them in closing. It's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to be weary. It's easy to be discouraged whenever you hear of actions, there are things happening in your life. But let's ever remember that it's only for a season. Even the most difficult trials and valleys do come to an end because Christ is coming again. And hymn writer said, Look, ye saints, the sight is glorious. See the man of sorrows now from the fight returned victorious. Every knee to him shall bow. Hark those bursts of acclamation. Hark those loud triumphant chords. Jesus takes the highest station. Oh, what joy this sight affords. Crown him, crown him, King of kings and Lord of lords. You know, you can never have too high a view of Christ. And the more you think of him, then the blessed you'll be. And I trust and pray that will be the case this morning. Let's pray. Our gracious heavenly Father, we thank thee and praise thee for the great encouragement in God's word. We thank thee we have one who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Lord, although this world is in the very last days raising their greatest attack against the things of God, we thank thee and praise thee, they will be defeated. We thank thee, Lord, thou hast said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We thank thee, Lord, every time we preach, every time we open this building for the proclamation of the gospel, we're attacking the gates of hell. And we thank thee, Lord, we always have the victory. And we pray, Lord, that thou wilt cause us as a church to to continually press on all power, is given unto me in heaven and earth, therefore go. Lord, help us to go. Help us to go forth in the name of the Lord against the foe. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that in our individual lives, you will help us as God's people to be holy. Oh, Lord, the great need of the church today, the holiness of the people of God. Lord, what would it be if we all were overflowing the blessing of God? What would it be, Lord, if our lives were a blessing to others? What would it be if our lives were a blessing to your brethren and sisters? Oh, Lord, I pray that that will be the case. Not just something we aspire to, but something we enjoy. 
Oh, Lord, make it a present reality. I pray God's people will be a blessing in this place. Pray, Lord, for those who are in difficulty today, discouraged. Oh, Lord, please lift them up. Pray for those, Lord, who seek to cause disunity among the people of God. Lord, restrain them. Pray for the little foxes that spoil the vines. Lord, banish them. And we pray for the unsaved in this gathering today. Oh, Lord, we've learned the end of the wicked. We've learned the end of the ungodly. Oh, Lord, for eternity, under the wrath of the Holy God. Lord, we cannot describe hell too fearfully or too much. Oh, how great our limitations are. But we pray that the Holy Ghost will give an understanding that even can't be uttered. And Lord, cause the soul to tremble till it seeks pardon in Christ. Lord, see if we pray. Thank thee for those whom you saved this past week. And we pray, Lord, even this week again, that we'll come and visit with salvation. For we ask and receive your precious and holy name. Amen.